for joining Kingdom Come Ministries live stream, where our leaders are Apostle William Rogers Jr. and Prophetess Dr. Donna Rogers. We are grateful that you are with us today. Let's prepare our minds to receive the Word of God. about kingdom power and we're going to continue to build on this foundation but I want to make sure that you listen attentively for where the spirit of the Lord is shifting us individually and collectively and so here our foundational scripture in the book of Acts we're looking at chapter 1 and we're looking at verse 8 the new covenant the new King James Version and it says, but you, oh, that's personal, shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and unto the end of the earth. And so we're talking about kingdom power. And we've been sharing with you that God never intended us to live this Christian life or on our own. He never, God never intended for us to work ministry by ourselves. That was not his design. What we need to live an empowered life is already on the inside of us. The Bible says greater is he, meaning the spirit of God, that is in you, this is personal now, than the spirit, the antichrist spirit, the spirit of the enemy that is in the world. God's presence and God's power and God's peace live within us on the inside of us. And we are not alone. I want to encourage you today that you're never alone. Sometimes you go through life situations and life circumstances and the enemy try to deceive you and trick you and make you feel like you're all by yourself and you alone. But we are truly a part of something greater than ourselves. And it's the objective of the enemy and the job of the enemy to try to make you feel like you're all by yourself. As we laid today's foundation, during Jesus' earthly ministry, he spoke about many subjects. But the subject that Jesus spoke about more than any other was the subject closest to his heart. And it was God's kingdom. He centered his life on preaching and declaring the good news of the kingdom. When Jesus began his ministry, the first words that came out of his mouth were the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. That means change your way and believe in the gospel. He just didn't talk about the kingdom of God at the beginning of his ministry. Christ proclaimed the kingdom of God in his preaching and demonstrated it in his miracles and healings. Throughout the accounts of Jesus' ministry, he is always talking about the kingdom of God. Many of his parables explain something about this kingdom. It is like mustard seed. He said a treasure, a merchant looking for pearls, and a king who gave a banquet. Jesus said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to other cities also. For this is my purpose, why I came. He was crucified as the king of the Jews. He was raised from the dead as the king of the world. And then he gathered his disciples after his crucifixion and his resurrection to speak to them for the last time, not about love, not about money, not about forgiveness. When he gathered his disciples for the last time 
before he ascended up into glory and sat on the right hand of his father. The last words that somebody speak to you, you hold dear to your heart. You go back. You say, well, the last, this is the last thing they said to me. Well, this, the last time I spoke to them, this is what they said. Well, this is the last text that I received from them, the last email. And before the Lord Jesus was taken up into glory, the last thing he spoke to his disciples about was the kingdom of God. Come, let's go to Acts. We're looking at chapter 1. I want to read verse 3. I want to read verse 6. I want to read verse 4 and verse 8. The New Covenant, the Amplified Version. And it says, to these men, he, Jesus, also showed himself alive after his suffering in Gethsemane and on the cross by a series of many infallible proofs and unquestionable demonstrations appearing to them over a period of 40 days and talking to them about the things concerning pertaining the kingdom of God. Pastor, what was so important about the kingdom of God that Jesus kept talking to his disciples about over and over and over? And there's many parables in the scripture that he kept using symbolically to talk about the kingdom. And after everything Jesus taught his disciples and showed his disciples and demonstrated to his disciples, they had not yet fully comprehended the nature of the kingdom of God. Please hear me today. Because we can hear the word of the Lord. We can hear it preach. We can hear it taught. We can read it. And still, sometimes we don't fully comprehend and understand the nowness, the logos, the rhema of God's word. So it says here in verse 6 of Acts, so when they had come together again, they asked him repeatedly. Now wait, hold, hold up. They asked him over and over and constantly, over and over, talking, Jesus, what do you mean about the kingdom? Over and over again. They repeatedly asked Jesus, Lord, are you at this time reestablishing the kingdom and restoring it to Israel? Now, to ask this question, they were still lacking in their understanding. They were still lacking because Jesus had told them, hey, you go out and preach the kingdom because this is what I was anointed to do. And so all power, all authority is in my hand. And now I'm passing the baton to you and giving it to you for you to do. But how can you preach something you don't understand? How can you walk out something that you can't comprehend? So they kept asking him. And I'm, I'm going to camp out here for a moment. Because the first century Jews got the kingdom of God all wrong. And so do many Christians today. When we don't understand the kingdom of God, we get caught up in other stuff. Other things cloud our mind and cloud our perception because we yet don't fully comprehend what Jesus is talking about here. They didn't really get it. As do many Christians today. If someone asked you what the kingdom of God meant, would you know how to answer them? When you're witnessing to people and talking to people, do you know what you're witnessing about? They didn't fully comprehend it. Their understanding of the nature of the kingdom of God caused the first century Jews to reject Christ as their Messiah. When you don't understand what God is doing in his nowness, when you don't understand what the spirit of the Lord is, when you don't understand the rule, the reign, the authority of God, his government, then you reject what he's saying because you can't even see it, hear it, or understand it. In their minds, they thought that the city of Jerusalem and its magnificent temple was their future. All they thought was the church 
was their future. All they thought was the, the temple, Jerusalem. They thought this was it. And when the Jerusalem temple was destroyed, they were confused, confounded. Now, what are we going to do here? They didn't understand. In their minds, they assumed that this earthly kingdom was theirs alone and that it would last forever. See, when we get stuck with a church mentality, when all we can see is in the four walls of the assembly, the local assembly, and we can't see the rule and the reign and the power and the authority of God. We can't see that we're supposed to submit and bow our lives to the lordship of Jesus Christ. We're supposed to submit our families, submit our homes, submit our money, submit our marriages, submit our relationship, submit our mindsets to the Lord Jesus. Then we reject his government. And then we start walking in our own government. What the Jews failed to realize is this. The God who made the world and everything whatsoever is in it. The Lord of heaven and earth. He says, <laughs> oh Jesus. He says, I'm not going again dwell in temples made with hands. So they were still looking for him to come and rebuild this Jerusalem temple. And God is saying, I'm talking about kingdom now. The kingdom of God that Jesus promised was not a physical kingdom that could be destroyed or lost. It is the spiritual realm in which God rule and God reign over everything. And it is acknowledged and he was trying to teach them that the kingdom of God lives within us. Wherever we go as Christians, wherever we go as believers of the Lord Jesus, the kingdom of God shows up. The power and the authority of God shows up. And so to understand the kingdom message, Jesus proclaimed the disciples had to abandon their own perception and expectation of a new political order centered in Jerusalem. If you're going to receive, that's why Jesus' first message was, look, <laughs> the kingdom of God is at hand, and you're going to have to repent. You're going to have to abandon your ideologies. You're going to have to abandon your theories. You're going to have to abandon what you think. You're going to have to leave all of that stuff alone to receive this kingdom. Many of the kingdom principles are therefore counterintuitive and they require us to unlearn, to discard from one's own memory, long held assumptions and be reoriented to a new way of thinking. Now, if I'm going to accept this kingdom power and I'm going to be a kingdom citizen and I'm going to live in the kingdom of God, I'm going to have to unlearn some stuff and abandon some stuff and get rid of some stuff that's not of God. I'm going to talk to you today. I don't know who taught you that. I don't know who trained you according to that. But that's not kingdom. That's not the word of the Lord. Have you ever seen a snake shed his skin? As the snake grows, the old skin stretches until it can no longer contain the snake. The snake then glides across a rough surface to leave his old skin behind. The old skin is often full of parasites, full of religion, full of wounds, full of old structures, old ideas. But they have to get left behind as the snake emerges and he renews himself. Pastor, what do you send? A spirit and power life constantly stretch us. We can't stay the same. You can't stay the same. I'm, I, 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 you know, I got to teach this because the Holy Spirit wants this church to shift. When I speak about the church, I'm speaking about we, the body of Christ, individually and collectively. The Holy Spirit, a spirit and power life constantly stretches us. Our old skin, our bad habits of thinking and relating to one another are being left behind. I don't think that way no more. I don't respond that way no more. I got a new heart to know them, a new heart to love them. 
all of that, everything begins to change. Because the kingdom of God was a central part of Jesus' message. It was one of the greatest messages he ministered of importance. Yet the true nature of the kingdom of God as proclaimed by Jesus is rarely fully understood. Again, if I was to ask you as a believer, talk to me about the kingdom of God. What would you be able to say? I didn't say talk to me about church. I didn't say talk to me about the local assembly. Talk to me about the realm of God, the rule of God, the reign of God, the authority of God, the power of God for his church. And if we don't understand the kingdom of God, we won't be able to understand the events that's happening in our world. We'll have trouble discerning between truth and falsehood and be open to deception. And we will not be able to fulfill our true purpose, whose mission as the body of believers is vision and actions, which are based on the principles of God's kingdom. If we don't understand kingdom, then we can't advance his kingdom. You can't advance what you don't understand. Please go with me to the gospel according to St. Matthews. We're looking at chapter 13, and we're looking at verse 19, clause A. The new covenant, the new King James Version. And the word of the Lord says, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. The word of God must be understood before it can truly bear fruit. Not only are we to be faithful, we're to be fruitful. And so we can't be fruitful if we don't understand the kingdom. We have to understand, okay, Holy Spirit, what is being said now? Where is the church, the body of believers supposed to be at now? So it says here in verse 23, but he who received seed on the good ground is he who hears the word. Is he who hears the word. And not only do they hear it, they understand it who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some 60, and some 30. Because we can come to a local assembly, and the Bible tells us to forsake not the assembling of ourselves together, so we in line, in alignment with the word of the Lord. We can come to a local assembly, and we can hear the word all day long, but if you don't get an understanding of that word, you're going to be deceived. Because one of Satan's chief work is to keep men in darkness regarding their understanding of the gospel. That, that's his job. Please look at 2 Corinthians. We're looking at chapter 4, and we're looking at verses 3 through 4, the new covenant, the TLB version. It says, if the good news we preach is hidden to anyone, it is hidden from the one who is on the road to eternal death. And so the enemy knows that if I can keep the gospel, if I can keep the word out of the hearts of people, then I know they can be deceived. You can say all day long, well, you know, pastor, I read my word. I do this. I do that. You, you can say that all day long. And then I'm going to come back to you and tell you what God did. He said, I've given to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teacher. Why? To enlighten you, to bring understanding to your heart, to your spirit concerning the word that you say you're reading at home. And so it says here in verse four, Satan who is the God of this evil world, has made him blind, unable to see the glorious light of the gospel that is shining upon him. He's keeping them in bondage so they can't see the light nor understand the amazing message we preach about the glory of Christ who was God. So here, the kingdom of God was a very powerful message. And I'm, and I'm studying it. Now, wait a minute. You said up on this rock, I build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So, you know, then you turned around and gave the church, not the keys to the church, but the keys to the kingdom. So, so, so what's so powerful about this? Because when we understand kingdom, we understand our authority. When we understand kingdom, we understand who we are and what our purpose and assignment is in life. 
And when you only understand church, you only understand positions and titles, auxiliaries, boards, Coming on Sunday, Sunday school, YPWW, BTU, that's all you understand. When you understand kingdom, you understand I can walk in authority in the community, in the marketplace. I can walk in authority at home. I can walk in authority on my job. I can walk in authority if I got a job or not. I can walk in authority if somebody reject me or not. When you understand the kingdom, you understand who you are, who God called you to be in the earth. What your purpose and your assignment is. And a lot of people get stuck in that church mentality, which don't give you any identity with the Father. I'm going to talk to you today. So Jesus was talking to his disciples. What was he doing, Pastor? He was shifting their mindset. There was a paradigm shift taking place. A paradigm shift is defined as a time when the usual and accepted way of doing or thinking about something, it changes completely. Okay, so I, I, I know I told you all, I'm going to build my church. But then I turned around and told you, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. Now you're going to have to understand this concept. You're going to have to understand you have authority now. And you're going to have to walk that authority out. Because a paradigm is a mental grid. The central issue is how we think. He was shifting his disciples' thinking. You've been thinking that old way for a long time. He came to shift that mindset. And this is what Apostle Paul had in mind when he wrote, Do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. Jesus was shifting their mindset to a kingdom perspective. We cannot advance his kingdom without having that kingdom mentality. In essence, a kingdom mindset regards Christianity as a biblical world and life view centered on the person of Jesus Christ who is Lord over all creation. Thank you for listening to me because I, I, I'm camped out here for a minute, but I'm going to move on. Those with a church mindset view Jesus merely as the king of the church. And not the king of all earth, secular kings. A kingdom mindset releases all believers as ministers into the marketplace. A church mindset merely trains people to serve in a church building on Sunday. A kingdom mindset views the Bible as a blueprint to structure every aspect of society. A church mindset views the Bible merely as a book that enable us to escape the world, enter heaven, and be super spiritual. With a kingdom mindset, churches embrace and love their surrounding unchurched communities. With a church mindset, churches only embrace converted individuals within their faith community. You don't reach out, you don't witness, you don't talk to nobody. Well, pastor, why do you say that? Because... This is what the word of the Lord says. He says, one plant, another water, I'm going to give the growth. I'm going to give the increase. But how are you expecting growth and increase and you ain't planting and you ain't watering? I need to put a praise right there. I'm going to talk to you today because I feel like talking. Somebody say kingdom. kingdom. He ain't talking about this church mentality. He said, listen, a kingdom mindset. The churches embrace and love their surrounding unchurched communities. We don't judge, we love. We don't reject, we accept. That's what a kingdom mindset. That's, that's, that's what a kingdom mindset. We have to understand this. And then again, let me repeat it. With a church mindset, churches only embrace converted individuals within their faith community. I can only love you because you're in my faith community. That's not a kingdom mentality. And that's the reason why Jesus was telling them, now listen, you got to understand when we talk about kingdom because the Bible going to tell you if they slap you on one cheek, 
turn the other. And the church mentality going to slap you back. And in other words, what he's saying, if they slap you on one cheek, do the opposite. That's all he's saying. A kingdom mindset trains people for all of life. It trains you for all of life. How to live, how to handle your finances, how to handle your relationships, how to handle education. It teaches you how to live in all of life, not just church. Some people don't know how to live. I don't mean to holler at you today, but I'm kind of compassionate about this. Uh, some people don't know how to live beyond the four walls of the church. You don't talk to nobody beyond the four walls of the church. You don't have no relationships beyond the four walls of the church. You don't go out and fellowship with nobody beyond the four walls of the church. So that's a church mentality. But a kingdom mindset, what Jesus was talking to his disciples about, the ones that were going to be the leaders of the new covenant church, he was training them for all of life. Now, you're going to have to know how to handle your children. You're going to have to know how to handle your spouse. You're going to have to know how to handle trials and tribulations. You're going to have to know how to handle problems and persecution. Kingdom mindset gives you the authority to let you know, I got the upper hand. I win in every area of life. Who am I talking to today? Every, somebody say every area. I don't care what it look like. You, you, you have to understand this. But here, a church mindset trains people only for church life. And then they be bickering and arguing and fussing and fighting over church life instead of kingdom. When a kingdom mindset there is emphasized with a kingdom mindset, the marketplace is emphasized. A church mindset only emphasized the church place. So, <laughs> Jesus was saying, now listen, I done been with you over three years, now it's time for me to go. But I got to make sure you comprehend and you understand kingdom. The command of Jesus to teach and make disciples of all the nations implies that there is a distinctively biblical way of thinking and seeing the world. And the church must be represented in each fear. God just don't want us stuck in the local assembly, stuck in the church. He just don't want us stuck in the upper room. He don't want us just always up there praying about God. Would you please bless me with this? Would you please? Will you step out on faith and go get what belongs to you? Would you realize you got that authority and you got that power? He don't just want us just praying, please, God, please, Holy Father. Will you open this door? And he said, the door have already been opened. But you won't come out that upper room because you love that church mentality. But the church must be represented in each sphere. Religion, families, education, government, media and art, science and technology and business. If the power of darkness is going to be broken in those fears, then the church have to penetrate those fears. The church have to know their authority. Don't be talking about, I ain't got this and I ain't got that. He gave you power to create wealth. Or do you just, you just want to stay a beggar? You don't want to be challenged because that's, that's what the word of the Lord come to do to expand us and grow us and challenge us. You don't want to be challenged. I would hate to be sitting up under a leader that don't challenge me to grow. Don't challenge me to do better. Don't challenge me to produce. Not able to shift the church to where the Holy Spirit is. You got a pastor that loves you, but I love God more. I'm going to be obedient to what God tell me to do, and I'm going to do it till he call me home. Do I have a witness in this place? You got to understand this. As you lead, I don't see what you see because I'm leading. When you driving, you can look around and see whatever you want to see. I can. I got to keep my focus. And so you have to understand this. What we don't possess become fair game for the powers of darkness to occupy and destroy. On the mountain of religion, if you don't, if you don't get there, if you don't do 
what your assignment is, what, what the gift of God is on your life to do, what he have anointed you for, then you giving room for the enemy. Let's, let's, let's go back here to, to Acts 1 and 4. Are you still with me? So then he says, while being together and eating with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem. So now you know your assignment and you know what I've called you to do. But don't you leave Jerusalem. But to wait for what the Father had promised, of which he said, you have heard me speak. Because Jesus knew that they were not qualified and prepared for their assignment at this time. He knew that. So he told them, you wait here until I give you the ability, the enablement to do that in which I called you to do. We have a problem waiting. Hurry up, God. How long do I got to wait? Now, you know I done been here 12 years. God says, I'm not looking at how long you've been here. I'm looking at your immaturity. I'm looking at you're still not able to comprehend or understand. So I can't send you out there to do something that you don't understand. So he told him in verse 8, but you, that's personal, the believer, will receive dunamis power, miraculous power, might and strength, and ability when, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses to tell people about me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and even to the ends of the earth, a global perspective. He says, now listen, you, you wait until you have the empowerment and the ability to get the job done. And so when Jesus asks someone to do something, he always makes sure that we are well equipped to do what he asks us to do. He never calls us to be anything or do anything that he doesn't give us the power to be able to do it. Jesus empowers us to do what he asks. Please go with me to the gospel according to St. Matthews. We're looking at chapter 14. Are you still here? And we're looking at verses 25 through verse 30, the new covenant, the new King James Version. And it says, now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink. He cried out saying, Lord, save me. In other words, Jesus enabled Peter to do what he commanded. He told Peter to come. And then he gave him the enablement and the power to walk on water to come. And the only time Peter began to sink is when he took his eyes off the promise, the word that God told him to do. When we take our focus off of our assignment and off of the word of God and the command of God, then we begin to sink in every area of our lives. Why? Because we can't do it on our own. He never intended for us to live this life on our own. The Holy Spirit empowers us to do what we are not able to do. Please go with me to Numbers. We're looking at chapter 11, looking at verses 24 through verses 25. I need to show this to you because I believe we have the understanding that when we receive the Holy Spirit and we speak in an unknown tongue, that's it. And we think we have the Holy Spirit just for spiritual things. And not just to be a witness for the Lord or to lead and guide us and direct us. Numbers 11, 24 through 25, the old covenant, the NIV version, it says, So Moses went out and told the people what the Lord had said. He brought together 70 of their elders and had them stand around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke with him. And he took some of the power of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. I need you to pay very close attention to this. And when the spirit rested on them, the 70 elders, what did they do? But did not do so again. Now, we got to understand the word prophecy is not to be understood here as somebody implying the knowledge and discovery of a future event. Because a lot of people like to confuse. See, when you lack the understanding of the spirit of prophecy and the gift of prophecy and then the office of the prophet, then you be all over the place. 
But this, this, this wasn't talking about the office of a prophet. What this was talking about was the spirit. It was talking about the gift. It says, and so the gift, the word prophecy here, it signifies to teach and proclaim truth through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Just stay with me now. Their gift was only temporarily. Why? The spirit rested on them. He wasn't in them. The Holy Spirit didn't come into the new covenant. They prophesied under the unction of the Holy Spirit. That's the reason why the Bible says, but he who prophesies speaketh edification, which is strength, and exhortation, which is encouragement, and comfort, which is consolation to men. You call yourself prophesying and you downgrading people and, and you telling them you going to hell and you did that's 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 not prophecy. That's no no. We have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us. Somebody say for edification, exhortation, and comfort. And so we are given spiritual gifts by the Holy Spirit and therefore a witness to non-believers and an affirmation to hope to believers. So when the Spirit came on them, what did they do? They prophesied. They began speaking about God's word. Please go with me to Numbers 24, 1 through 4. I need to show you this. It says, now when Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, he did not resort to divination as at other times, but turned his face towards the wilderness. When Balaam looked out and saw Israel in camp, tribe by tribe, look here again, the spirit of God came on him. And what did he do? And he spoke his message. The prophecy of Balaam, son of Beor. The prophecy of one whose eyes see clearly. The prophecy of one who hears the word of God. Who sees a vision from the Almighty. Who falls prostrate and whose eyes are open. So when the spirit of God came on him, what did he do? He began to speak the message of God. Please go with me to Ezekiel chapter 11. We're looking at verse 5, the old covenant, the message version. You still here with me? It says, then the spirit of God came upon him and he told me what to say. This is what God says, that a fine public speech, Israel, <laughs> but I know what you're thinking. So when the spirit came on him, what did he do? He began to speak what God was speaking. That's the old covenant. Now let's go to the new covenant. Because what I'm trying to get the church, the body of Christ to understand how we have the Holy Spirit and we ain't prophesying? How we have the Spirit of God and we ain't talking to nobody? How we having the Spirit of God and we are not edifying nobody? We are not comforting nobody. We're not exhorting nobody. Let's look here at the gospel according to St. Luke. We're looking at chapter 1. I want to read verses 13 through verse 17. The New Covenant, the New King James Version. It says, but the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. For your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. It says in verse 16, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him, Jesus, in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Who is this talking about? This is talking about John the Baptist. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit will empower him for his assignment to proclaim the coming of the Lord. Verse 41 says, the same chapter, Luke 1, and it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And then what happened? Then she spoke out with a loud voice and said, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. When Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, what did she do? She spoke. She prophesied. Verse 67 says, now his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Spirit. And what did he do? He prophesied. He proclaimed truth through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Saying, blessed 
is the Lord God of Israel. But he has visited and redeemed his people. So when Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit, what did he do? He spoke. Over and over again in scripture, we see when the Holy Spirit rested on them or came on them or they were filled, they started prophesying and speaking the word of the Lord to others. If I was to ask you, how long have you been filled with the Spirit of God? My next question would be, how long have you not been prophesying, speaking life, exhortation, and comfort into the lives of people? And so we see the same thing here when the Holy Spirit comes down in the New Testament church for the first time at Pentecost. What happens there? The same thing. This is the reason why Jesus told his disciples, you wait for this power. Because when the power comes, you're going to have to prophesy. You're going to have to witness. You're going to have to tell people the good news about the gospel. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they begin to speak. Please go with me to Acts. We're looking at chapter 2. I want to read verse 1 through 7, verses 12 through verse 18. The New Covenant, the Amplified Version. It says, when the day of Pentecost, the feast day in Jerusalem had come, arrived, they, the 120 that were all together in one place in the upper room, And suddenly a sound came from heaven like a rushing violent wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. There appeared to them tongues resembling fire which were being distributed among them. And they rested on each one of them as each person received the Holy Spirit. Now I need you to hear me clearly. Our tongues can be set on fire either for heaven or hell. Either one. Why do you say that, Pastor? Because the Bible says, so also, this is what it says in the book of James, so also the tongue is a small thing, but what enormous damage it can do. A great forest can be set on fire by one tiny spark, and the tongue is a flame of fire. It is full of wickedness and poison, every part of the body, and the tongue is a set on fire by hell itself and can turn our whole lives into a blazing flame of destruction and disaster so when the Holy Spirit came it was like a flame of fire for God but when it's not the Holy Spirit your tongue can be used for the enemy and the tongues of fire symbolize the powerful witness of the church to the people and so it says here in verse 4 and they were all filled that is diffused throughout their being with the Holy Spirit and began to do what? Speak in other tongues. All through the scripture, you see when the Holy Spirit came, he came to empower them for witness. He came to empower. How is it that you just want to speak in an unknown tongue in the four walls of the church? Can't get through a song without speaking in tongue. Can't have pray without speaking in tongue. But you can't prophesy to the people on the outside. Are you hearing me today? It says, and they begin to speak in other tongues, different languages as the Holy Spirit was giving them the ability to speak out clearly and appropriately. So you got to understand the Holy Spirit empowers us for the coming task that God given us to do. It has to do with power for witness and service. I am empowered for witness and service. When I think kingdom, I realize I am empowered for witness and service. When I think church, I think I'm fearful, I'm afraid, I'm scared, pastor. I don't know what to say. What am I supposed to do? How do cuss words come out your mouth? Who empowered them? Okay, (laughs) okay. (laughs) So uh, we gotta understand now that we have the spirit, I bind up that spirit of fear because you are a citizen of the kingdom of God. And greater is he that's within you than he that's within the world. So you don't have nothing to fear. You have power to witness. You have power to proclaim the good news of the Lord Jesus. Are you hearing me? Don't just want to be seen in the local assembly. We know the word. Okay. (laughs) And those that don't got a pastor that's teaching them the word. My question to you is, what are you doing? Okay. I got a witness over here on my left. 
I don't know what's going on over here on the right. <laughs> but we got to understand the Holy Spirit that we have, it has to do with power for witness and service. Somebody say, I have power for witness and service. Say one plant, another water, God's going to grow that thing. Now bless God right there. This is my job as your pastor to teach you this. Because if I don't teach you about planting and watering, there won't be no growth. Hello? As long as you've been in the kingdom, however many years, just think if you have won a soul one year for every time you've been in the kingdom, how many souls would you have? How many Jews would you have in your crown? But I understand you got church stuck in that church mentality where you thought the pastor was supposed to do it all. Matter of fact, who you bring with you today? Matter of fact, who have you witnessed to all past last week? Who, what have you planted? And who's going to water it so God can give the increase? Who have you brought with you today for God to give the increase? Come on now. Somebody say, talk to us, pastor. Because I got to break that church mentality off you. The church mentality is, I want our pastor to do it all. I'm only one person. I want our pastor to do it all. I want our pastor to go out there and do it all. Then what's your job? What are you supposed to do? Hello? I can't hear you. Then what's your job? What are you supposed to do? That's, that's, the Bible gives me precise instructions in the book of Ephesians. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers, you take them, you train them, those that will allow you to, and you mature them, then you disciple them. And as I disciple you, you disciple others. Don't want me to disciple you and spend all that time with you when you ain't discipling nobody else and spending time with nobody else. You got, you got to understand kingdom. It's about kingdom now. Kingdom deals with teamwork. Kingdom deals with unity. Kingdom deals with apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. It just don't deal with one person. And so you think about it. I'm just going to make it a little personal. As long as you've been connected to kingdom come ministry. How many seeds have you sown? How many seeds have you watered? For God to give the increase. Where they at? Don't get quiet on me now. You know your pastor ain't scared of you. Where they at? Why you always want to be part of a church that's built instead of part of a church that's building? You, 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 you got to understand here. You, you, you have to understand here. I heard my apostle said, that's what the apostolic do. It builds. Paul went to places where there wasn't a church. He left to build. Either you are a gatherer or a scatterer. Either you are building or you are destroying. The Holy Spirit, it has to do with power for what? Say witness and service. I said, well, I got to get through this. And then verse 5, it goes on. It says, now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout and God-fearing men from every nation under the heaven. And when this sound was heard, a crowd gathered, and they were bewildered because each one was hearing those in the upper room, in the upper room, speaking in his own language or dialect. In other words, God wants the whole world to know about the gospel. That's why he allowed every nation that was there to hit them in the upper room speak about the goodness of God. And it says here in verse 7, they were completely astonished saying, look, are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? And they were beside themselves with amazement and were greatly perplexed saying one to another, what could this mean? You know why they were saying what could this mean? Because they had never seen kingdom power in operation some people don't know apostolic authority some people don't know prophetic authority all you know is church and so it says in verse 13 but others were laughing and joking and, and ridiculing them saying they are full of sweet wine and are drunk 
But Peter, standing with the 11 disciples, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be explained to you. Listen closely and pay attention to what I have to say. This was the same Peter that was fearful and ashamed of Jesus. This was the same Peter who, when they asked him, are you with this man? He, he denied him three times. Jesus already told him, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. Because his mentality wasn't shift the kingdom yet. How did Peter stand up boldly and begin to boldly speak and proclaim the word of God to these people? Because he was filled with the power of God. He says in verse 15, these people are not drunk as you assume since it is only the third hour of the day, 9 o'clock a.m. In other words, the Orthodox Jews did not eat or drink before 9 a.m. So we ain't drunk yet. That's all he's saying. We ain't drunk yet. <laughs> then verse 16 says, but this is the beginning of what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. This is that same Holy Spirit that Joel wrote about. And I need you to hear me. And it shall be in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit upon all mankind, all flesh, all nations, and your sons and your daughters. This is not leaving nobody out. Listen to me, millennials. This is not leaving nobody out. You ain't too young to witness. You're not too young to walk in that kingdom power and authority. You, you're not too young. To stand for Christ. You don't have to be up and down all the time. Square your shoulders. Stabilize your spirit. And realize you have authority as a citizen of the kingdom of God to advance his kingdom. He says because all flesh. And not just the mothers and the fathers. The, the children, the sons and the daughters. Shall prophesy. This is a promise here shall proclaim truth through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And your young men shall see divinely prompted vision. I need these young men to start seeing stuff in the spirit. I need you to start getting your spirit in alignment with the word of God. See, the Holy Spirit comes to give us identity and come to give us purpose for who we are. And you can't see it outside of yourself. And sometimes when you're lazy and you don't want to be challenged, you don't want to do it at all. It says, then your young men shall see divinely prompted vision. What visions are you seeing? Pastor, this is what I'm seeing. Is that in alignment with you? Am I on point? Am I on target? Am I off? It says this. Your young men shall... See divinely prompted visions, inspired appearances, and your old men shall dream dreams, divinely prompted dreams, divine revelation. What is God showing you, older men? What is God showing you in the spirit, kingdom, teamwork, unity? Pastor, this is what I saw. Pastor, this, I believe this is what God said. What is God showing you? What are you dreaming about? And then he says, even on my bond servants, both men and women, he won prejudice about this power. I will in those days pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. We're in an hour that it's time for you to open your mouth. We're in a day and time that the world need us. To open our mouth. You can't just stay locked up in the four walls of the church or locked in the upper room and won't open your mouth. This is an hour that the Holy Spirit is prompting the body of Christ to open her mouth and prophesy. We are enabled to declare God's truth in a divine way through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And the gifts... They want to be manifested. They want to manifest through your life. But you won't even open your mouth and prophesy. God uses dreams and visions as ways to talk to us. Now, I need you to understand something. Not all dreams are direct communications of God. You just ate a pizza late at night and that grease got in your system and you start dreaming about the wrong thing. Who am I talking to? Who am I talking to? All dreams ain't God. Somebody say, all dreams ain't God. But, Pastor, I had a dream. You, you a lie. 
all dreams is not God. You got to understand that. Because a dream is something that happened to you when you sleep. A vision is something that happened to you when you awake. So when you sleep and when you awake, God's trying to talk to you. But you have to be attentive to what he's saying. We have to understand this. Some dreams are just simply dreams. We are to filter all dreams and vision through the Holy Spirit. Well, how, how do I do that, Pastor? Line it up with the word of God. Whatever you think God done spoke to you, write it down and then line it up with the word of God. And if you cannot bring it into alignment with the word of God, you just had a dream. Because the Pentecostal experience that launched the church led the early disciples to boldly go out from their locked upper room and tell others. Of every nation they were there. They heard them speaking in their own language. Town people, they heard them. They went out and spoke to the stranger, the foreigners, the visitors, and the tourists about what? The kingdom of God about the kingdom of God, about the rule of God. Listen, God, God want to rule in your marriage. Listen, God want to rule in that finance of yours. They begin to speak to them about the kingdom of God. The early church had none of the things that we think are essential for success today. They had none of them. They didn't have no building, no whole worship in. They didn't have money. They didn't have political influence. They didn't have social status. And yet they want multitudes to Christ. Why? Because they had the power. Because they had the power. We want all this other stuff, but we don't want to allow the Holy Spirit to flow through us. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is to glorify Christ in the life and witness of the believer. And so we have been given authority and power to impact the earth with the message of the kingdom. If you are in this place today and you're hearing me, listening to me by way of stream, and you are a believer of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you are a citizen of the kingdom, you have to understand now that you have been given power and authority to proclaim the message of the kingdom. You have to understand that. We're not supposed to be waiting in the upper room forever. Not forever. We're supposed to be fruitful that was the kingdom mandate all the way back in the book of beginnings, in the book of Genesis. We're supposed to be fruitful and we're supposed to be multiplying. We're supposed to be reproducing after our kind. If I was to ask you, what's your kind, what would you say? Well, who are you supposed to be targeting? Who are you supposed to be going after? We're supposed to be reproducing after our kind. I have one more scripture and I'm coming to a close. When Jesus entered our world, he didn't box himself inside the four walls of the synagogue. He walked into the lives of sinners. He touched the lepers. He associated with prostitutes. He dined with heathens. And he scandalized the religious community by penetrating the world. In order for Jesus to reach and rescue the world, he had to penetrate it. How can we penetrate the world if we stuck in the upper room? Likewise, for us to impact and influence the world for Christ, we must penetrate it. And that's why the Bible says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations. We are to be witnesses who demonstrate the evidence of the reality of the kingdom of God. It's time for you to demonstrate the kingdom in your life. It's time for the kingdom to be demonstrated in your finances. It's time for the kingdom to be demonstrated in your world. Because the world needs our witness of his kingdom. When we witness to his kingdom, we are manifesting the testimony of Jesus. My last scripture, Revelations chapter 19. And we're looking at verse 10, clause B. The new covenant, the amplified version. It says, worship God alone, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. His life and teaching are the heart of prophecy. 
That is, prophecy centers around the person of Jesus Christ. That is what prophecy is all about. He is the center of it all. And so we have been given this kingdom power so we can proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, it's giving time. Proverbs 18 and 16 says, A gift opens the way and ushers the giver into the presence of the great. Here's a grand opportunity to be ushered into the presence of God by giving to him as he has so graciously given unto us. Will you take this time to enter into the presence of God with me by worshiping him through a gift? If so, go ahead and pull out your phone. Hit Cash App, type in the amount of your seed, and then dollar sign KCM Tampa 2. If you don't have Cash App, you can go to our web link to sow. I pray that the favor of the Lord forever be upon your life as you sow into this ministry.